Good evening and welcome to Repro Action's Act and Learn webinar for the month of July in 2017. Tonight our culture our topic is rape culture is a reproductive justice issue. So first we'll start with your host. The first voice you're hearing is myself, Erin Matson. I'm based in Arlington, Virginia. My pronouns are she and her, and um, and I'm a co-founder and co-director of Repro Action. And I am Pamela Merritt, and I'm based in St. Louis, Missouri. My pronouns are she and her, and I am the other co-founder and co-director of Repro Action. Great. So tonight's agenda is we'll introduce Repro Action, then we'll talk about and define rape culture. We'll do a panel discussion with Jacqueline Friedman and Charlie Chadwick. Um, we'll go over next steps, and then we'll do a Q&A with, um, with panelists or with Repro Action. And if you have questions for the Q&A, you're free to chat those into the chat box at any time throughout the presentation. We'll get to as many of them as possible at the end. I do want to give you a heads up that Jacqueline has generously joined us tonight when she has another engagement, so she will not be here live for the Q&A. Um, but if it sparks questions that you want others to talk about, feel free to chat those in while she's here. And feel free to live tweet under the hashtag ReproAction during the webinar tonight. So who is ReproAction? We are a new direct action group. We're actually two years old. Happy birthday to us. Um, formed to increase access to abortion and advance reproductive justice. We're incredibly proud of our left flank analysis. We have a willingness to hold folks on all sides of the issue accountable, regardless of whether they're traditionally thought to be allies or opposition. And we have a deep commitment to nonviolent direct action as one of the tools that we use to accomplish our goals. And with that, I'd like to pass it to Jessica Ensley, who is our um, campaign coordinator at Repro Action to talk about rape culture. Hi everyone, um, thanks so much for coming. So yeah, a lot of people, when they hear rape culture, if they're not uh, incredibly informed, a lot of people think it's a society in which rape is actually encouraged, but it's a little more deep than that. Um, so the Oxford Dictionary defines rape culture as a society or environment whose prevailing social attitudes have the effect of normalization or trivializing sexual assault and abuse. Um, so just over glance, it is the normalization of aggression and dominance over others, leading into an environment that blames the victims and ignores the actions of the perpetrator. Um, you can think of examples like uh, if you have ever known of someone who has been a victim or survivor and people, you know, saying, oh, they deserved it or they should have done these actions in order to avoid it. Um, some everyday examples uh, in pop culture, you can think about a lot of songs that really sexualize um, femme folk, um, like blurred lines, and really say, I know that you want it, I know what's best for you, um, even though you are expressing something different. It's telling people, specifically femme folk, to cover up in order to avoid attraction. It's uh, parents telling people that they need to cover their breasts or wear a longer skirt or cover their legs before they walk out of the door in order to feel safe. Um, street harassment or catcalling, being called, hey baby, by people driving along the side of the street um, is sort of the more milder end to it and it can get um, much more aggressive and violent depending on you know, where you're at uh, and everything. And another example is that, as I mentioned earlier, claims uh, of rape and sexual assault are false um, and that the victim is making it up or over exaggerating. So with that, I'm gonna kick it back to Erin. Thank you so much, Jessica. All right, so I'm going to unmute Jacqueline and it appears that my computer is acting a little funny tonight, so I apologize for that. Um, so introducing Jacqueline. Hello, Jacqueline, are you there? I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you wonderfully. Thank you. So Jacqueline uses the pronoun she, her. She is a writer, speaker, and activist. She is the creator of a number of wonderful books, including one that I recommend you check out when it becomes available on November 14th. It will be called Unscrewed the Future of Female Sexual Power. 
Um, she is the host of the podcast Unscrewed, um, which she has generously hosted Pamela and I on before. And she is the founder and former executive director of a kick-ass group, Women Action in the Media. So Jacqueline, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, let's dive right in. So my first question for you is, you popularized the phrase, yes means yes. What does this mean to you? Yes means yes is, it's meant to be a bookend to no means no, which, you know, when I was cutting my teeth on, on anti-rape activism back many, several decades ago, um, no means no was, you know, the big catchphrase, which is, of course, really important. No means no. If somebody says no to any kind of sexual interaction, you have to stop. Um, but no means no is inadequate. It's, it's necessary, but not sufficient. In order to have real consent, we need to have a, a culture that values the, the idea that only yes means yes. So you're only going to interact sexually with someone who is actively into whatever is happening. And if you can't tell, you have to ask. The rest of that's details. Now, there are a lot of details, and people like to get into it about the details, and we can if you want. But it's a pretty simple principle. And in reality, most people only want to be having sexual interactions with people who are into it. So it it comports with, you know, most people's basic ethics. It's just a question of talking about how do we do that and how do we create a culture that supports that idea. That's great. Yeah, just to dig into it a little more. So what do you say to people who say, well, I'm not used to talking or saying yes? Erin, you're like a little fuzzy. I didn't entirely understand the question. Oh, no. Um, so let me try one more time. So my question is, um, what do you say to people who say, I'm not used to talking during sex? I don't, I'm not accustomed to saying yes. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are uncomfortable saying yes for a variety of reasons, especially people who are female identified or, or sort of on the feminine end of the scale are told that, you know, we're not supposed to want sex for our own purposes. That makes us slutty and bad. And so, you know, a lot of people can feel shame about what we want. But also, you know, we don't see models either in any kind of sex ed, if we get sex ed at all, or in the media, you know, people actually directly communicating about sex very much. You know, we have what the, the fabulous writer and activist S. Bear Bergman calls the magic noses moment is mostly what we see modeled for like two people like just touch notices and they look at each other and they they know what they each other wants and they just have sex and it's wordless and perfect. And in reality, that's just not how sex works, right? And And the idea that talking about sex isn't sexy is a pervasive one, but also super laughable if you look at how much money you know, for example, phone sex industries make. <laughs> like, um, talking dirty is not that hard. Uh, you might feel silly. That's okay. Everyone feels awkward during sex. And we, I think we should be normalizing that too. Um, but the idea of yes means yes is really profound because it clarifies all of those supposed quote unquote gray areas, right? Like it changes the question if a sexual assault has occurred from, well, did you say no clearly enough to asking the perpetrator, right? Like how did you ensure you had consent, right? So it changes who the onus is on um, and it makes all of us responsible for making sure our partners are into what's happening. It makes us all more ethical and responsible partners um, and makes us all make sure we're caring for the people we're interacting with sexually. And I don't mean that in a like deeply committed, you know, relationship way. I just mean on a basic human level of care. Thank you, Jacqueline. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely brilliant and empowering. And it also sounds really sexy, which I'm excited about. So uh, my next question for you is, has, so things changed a lot in November of last year and then in January of this year, just to put a fine point on it. So um, as somebody who's been doing this for a long time, has the Trump administration, the mere existence of it, needless to say, all the attacks that they're putting out, have they changed the way you view your work as an activist on rape culture? And why or why not? I mean, the first thing that happened was that I had to spend two weeks convincing myself not to throw my whole manuscript in the trash. Because um, I was, I, the book 
Unscrewed, the book was coming out in, in November, was due, the first draft of it was due like December 15th. So I was heading into the home stretch of writing when that election happened. And I was, you know, Unscrewed is a big picture, like big vision for the world we could be living in. It's about how we could change the systems and institutions that affect our lives so that we can all have better access to our own sexual sovereignty. And so it's, you know, it's reaching to the future. And I suddenly was like, well, we're not going to be able to reach toward a big vision now. We're going to be lucky if we keep what we have. Um, but I, I kind of convinced myself and then I came to really believe that articulating those big forward visions is more important now than ever. It's just that we have to do double duty, right? So we have to be talking about what we're moving for and the world that we want to live in while also playing defense. I'm sure that some folks who are listening in know that last week, Betsy DeVos, the Secretary of Education, met with literal men's rights activists and, and rape apologists to get advice about how she should handle campus sexual violence. Um, you know, these are folks who lie about false rape reporting statistics and equate false rape reporting with rape in terms of it being as bad as, which is ridiculous, um, and who name and shame victims who prefer to stay anonymous. You know, these are bad dudes. Um, and not for nothing, these are dudes who have like literally harassed and targeted me for doing the work I do and lots of other people as well. So, you know, in an administration that's led by a serial sexual predator, um, we are going to have to be playing a lot of defense um, to make sure that we're keeping the gains that we've made in the last eight years under Obama. Um, but also, we have to not lose sight of the fact that people are motivated by a forward vision, right? Like if we only play defense, then all we can do is stay in the moment we're in, which is still a pretty crappy moment, right? Like that's the best we're going to do. We have to be trying to move the ball down the field toward our own goals. And we have to be able to articulate those goals to attract people to them. So it's kind of just more work. <laughs> it's just more work. More work. Right, right. Who needs sleep? Well, and it's really interesting. I mean, I'm also curious for your reaction to, so one of the many headlines, it's so hard to do proactive work these days, or it feels like it's so hard for things to get traction when it's just crisis after crisis to say nothing of all the attacks on people that's been led by this administration. But I'm also curious, so a couple days ago, Donald Trump made a comment about Brigitte Macron the the wife of the French Prime Minister being in great shape. And I'm just curious, do you see a relation between rape culture and also body image pressures that are on women? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Right? It's all born on the idea that like women are there to be sort of ornaments and props for men, right? Like it's all the same idea. And and if you don't act the right way, then men can do whatever they want to you. Or even if you do act the right way. That's literally what Trump said on those tapes, right? Um, and but the one thing I want that I want to point out that I didn't say before is that, you know, the Trump administration and, and many people in it are being very selective about when they care about violence against women. So for example, you know, Trump is publishing this list of immigrants who committed crimes, including sexual violence. Um, when also, his budget, like, slashes the Violence Against Women Act, right? You know, Jeff Sessions and Mike Pence have been really clearly against uh, trans folks getting to pee where the heck they want. Um, and, and the argument for that generally is, like, oh, we're trying to protect cis women from those terrifying trans people, which is, you know, obviously a, a terrifying and terrible argument. You know, the people who are actually at risk in public more often is trans folks. Um, but, you know, not to get too in the weeds with that argument unless you want to, you know, the idea of violence against women is trotted out in these retrograde ways. And I think that we have to be really smart about calling that out um, so that they don't get to claim that higher ground, because that's just another way of using women's bodies and women's safety as sort of props, right? This is just a political prop instead of a sexual prop mm -hmm. or a power prop. Yeah, no, it's... it's it's so profound. One thing that I want to underline on that, you know, when, so one of the things that the Trump administration has done. I'm sorry, I can't quite tell what you're saying. 
Oh, son of a biscuit. Could you hear that? My awful old joke. <laughs> um, <laughs> could you hear that or not? No? No. Okay. Crap. Um, okay. So I'll, I'll try to uh, move this along. You know, actually, um, if you can hear this question, I'll ask it of you. If not, I'm going to ask Jessica to ask it of you because I know that she knows. Yeah, question. you're much clearer now. Okay, great. I'm sorry for my technical technology tonight. Um, so okay. my question is, and going back to this big picture vision, you're an advocate of authentic sexu sexual liberation. What does that mean, first of all, authentic sexual liberation? And then how does it tie into fighting rape culture? And what are some ways that people can find their sexual liberation? So I know that's a lot of questions at once, but trying to get those in while you can still hear me. Sure, sure. I got it. Um, you know, when I talk about sexual liberation, what I want is for each of us to be free to experience our sexuality, however we do or don't experience it, um, you know, free of shame, blame, or fear, basically. Uh, and that means that some people are asexual and some people are polyamorous and some people are asexual and polyamorous. You know, it, 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 that it doesn't matter how you do it as long as you're not hurting anyone, right? Like your relationship to your sexuality and your body should be your business. Um, and, and nobody should be able to pressure you into being something else and, and, and sort of make you into a prop for their play instead of you getting to be the star of your own. You know, that's ultimately sexual liberation, sexual sovereignty, sexual self-determination. We can call it what we want. I think it's really important to talk about it in those terms because I think Sometimes when we hear about sex positivity, a lot of people feel excluded by that idea. It cannot, sometimes it's meant that way and sometimes it's meant in a very inclusive way, but the language can feel alienated. Sex has not been a positive force in everybody's life. And I think that sexual liberation has to acknowledge that, right? The good and the bad. Um, you get to have your own relationship to sexuality now how do we how do we pursue that in a world that doesn't really does not really set up for that um i mean i don't mean to sound self-promotional but i wrote a different book about that <laughs> um but you know it's it's a lot about trying to start sorting out what gives you pleasure what's rewarding and satisfying to you in terms of sexuality you know, and trying to separate that as best as you can from what you've been told should be set rewarding and satisfying. It's about really building the best sexual relationship you can with yourself. You know, I've long believed and said that the most important sexual relationship we ever have is the one we have with ourselves. Other people come and go, right? But you're always going to have a sexual relationship of one kind or another with yourself um, and making that a priority and really engaging in the exploration of your sexual relationship with yourself I think is that's the entry point right and you're going to hit roadblocks and it's going to be that you may be stigmatized or you know legitimately punished or oppressed depending on how your body is perceived in the world and how your sexuality is perceived in the world um, and that's real and I, I don't mean to minimize that and in fact there's a whole chapter in what you really want about like honestly, just sort of grieving that, <laughs> sort of looking at it head on and grieving it and, and figuring out how to live your best freest life given the current circumstances. Um, for me, in part, you know, the answer to that is, is activism, right? Like that what I do with my anger and grief about that stuff is I try to change circumstances. Um, but everyone's answer is going to be a little different. Jacqueline, that's incredibly inspiring and thank you for um letting people know that that's in your book promoting yourself we want you to promote yourself on here so that's great <laughs> um, uh, so i know we've got like literally 60 seconds left with you is there anything that you're dying to say or that you'd like to share with our audience oh gosh i'm just so glad that everyone's tuned in i really think that you know my my passion in this work is is tying together the sort of anti-sexual violence field and the sex positivity and, and sort of sexual education and sexual health fields and showing everybody that they're two sides of the same coin, right? You can't talk about 
having a healthy or liberated sexuality without dealing with the fact that some of us have been violated, maybe violated, leave in fear of violation, you know, et cetera. And you can't talk about doing anti-sexual violence work, not in a meaningful way, without talking about why sex sexuality and sexual sovereignty is so important and so crucial. And honestly, reclaiming my sexuality has been a big part of my healing from sexual violation. Um, and so I love the idea of, you know, tying this together with reproductive justice, which is the same thing. It's about our bodily self-determination, right? Um, and so, you know, I just love that you're making, you're connecting those dots, because I think the more we can see that we're all part of the same movement and, and work together, uh, you know, the stronger that we are. So I really thank you for doing the work. Here, here. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. And we look forward to speaking with you soon. Yes. I, sorry, I couldn't stay longer. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, it's an honor. Talk to you later. All right. Bye. Bye. So I'm, now I'm going to pass it over to Pamela to, um, to do Q&A with Charlie Chadwick. And unfortunately... My screen just keeps bugging out. I'm sorry. Pamela, will you do that? I'm also um, going to go on mute. So thank you. Thank you very much. Charlie, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? I sure can. Um, so it's yeah. my pleasure to talk to Charlie. Um, so Charlie is a campus advocate and training coordinator at Survivor Advocacy Program in rural Ohio and co-founder of Fuck Rape Culture, an activist group at Ohio University dedicated to eradicating rape culture on campus and in the towns of in the town of Athens, Ohio. Welcome, Charlie. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Fantastic. We're so happy to have you. Um, so my first question is, you've co-founded an organization at your college campus called Fuck Rape Culture. Can you explain, <laughs> <laughs> can you explain what inspired the organization and how you grew it? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's funny, even several years after co-founding this, my my parents still kind of shake their fist at me, like, you couldn't have picked another name. <laughs> um, but it seems to fit quite well. Um, so I want to say it was my sophomore year at Ohio University. Um, one of my good friends, Allie, and I were talking about a crime alert that we'd gotten from Ohio University Police Department. So, you know, I think most if not all college campuses do this, that if there's a crime that occurs on campus, they'll send out an alert with you know, information about the suspect. So they had sent out a crime alert about a person who was sexually assaulted by a friend who was walking them home from the bar. And then they provided these brilliant safety tips under that, um, saying things like, you should have a friend walk you home from the bar to keep you safe. You should, you know, you should not walk home alone at night. And it was, you know, a complete contradiction of what had happened to this young person. Um, the safety tips were offensive and outdated. And so we decided kind of from that, it, we started really being critical of a lot of other things that were happening on campus. And we decided, you know, enough is enough. So we decided to take to the streets about it. So we had um, homecoming is very big at OU. It's a very small college town. So homecoming is just, you know, a big parade, a lot of alumni come in and we decided, you know, to kind of get the most bang for our buck that we would have an event during this time. So the, homecoming parades on Saturday morning, and we decided that Friday evening, we would have a clothing optional march through the street, demanding that the university take sexual assault and the rape culture on campus seriously. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember kind of walking over the top of this hill with Allie, who I had, you know, organized this with, just thinking, you know, gosh, no one's going to show up. This was why did we do this? We're the only ones who care. And then just seeing a sea of people at the bottom of the hill, um, wow. you know, the response was incredible. So from there, um, 
we realized that this was an issue that a lot of people were seeing. We have a, a big party culture here. I think we were voted number one party school in, you know, Playboy or whatever it is, several years in a row. And so the university would constantly say that party school equals sexual assault. And so they were the only way in which they took sexual assault seriously was talking about the binge drinking culture. Mm-hmm. And while, you know, I understand that perpetrators do use alcohol as a way to incapacitate their victims, that isn't the real issue. It's, you know, the entitlement that a lot of young people were feeling here to other people's bodies and the culture of going to kind of the uptown area and that sexual harassment, catcalling, groping were just the norm. So we, you know, decided to disrupt that and it ended up being very successful. We, you know, demanded mandatory training for all incoming freshmen on consent. We worked with rewriting some of the policies to provide amnesty for students who are, you know, underage drinking or using drugs during the time of their assault that themselves and any witnesses will not be sanctioned if they, you know, call law enforcement or an ambulance. Um, And we brought awareness. Um, It's continued to be an issue that is really highly critiqued in this area, as well as, you know, there's still a lot of organizing still going on around the issue on campus. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for that vivid description. I got chills um, just picturing what it must have felt like for you um, and your co-organizer, your friend, to walk over that hill. Thank you so much. Um, So currently, Charlie, you're traveling to schools within the Appalachian community to advocate and provide training on, on these issues. Do you Do you think your work plays out differently in rural and economically challenged or poor communities? And if so, how? Absolutely. Um, So I'll probably start off by saying that this is an overwhelmingly white community. Mm -hmm. So racial dynamics are always a very interesting conversation and a lot of times a big barrier for people of color in this area. Um, but so I I work with folks at University of Rio Grande as well as Hawking College. Um, and then I also work a lot in the regional jail and you know we have a seven county service area. So we've got a lot of ground to cover and a pretty small staff. So I would say that, you know, looking at the comparison of the university culture to, because I'm still in the Athens area, so Ohio University versus Athens County and the surrounding counties, there is a very distinct difference. Um, Mm -hmm. There's a lot of geographic isolation. Uh, So, you know, you have very small populations that are very spread out um, with, very, you know, complete food deserts. I think Athens and Megs are pretty consistently competing for the poorest counties in the state. Mm. So when you look at the isolation, it is really compounded by things like there is very limited access to electricity and running water in some of these areas. There definitely is limited if any wi-fi or you know internet capacity so through that a lot of folks don't have reliable access to phones Mm -hmm. and so when you look at people who are in a level of poverty where if they have an automobile they more than likely don't have you know the service area is five hours from a five-hour drive from top to bottom and with very few hospitals, very few police stations, very few, you know, resources for transitional housing or healthcare or, you know, really any needs that people have, it becomes a very big difficulty and an extreme barrier for people to access those resources. 
so you know we work with folks who are you know interested in pursuing long-term counseling care who have experienced you know decades of violence and it's a two and a half hour drive to the nearest therapist mm -hmm. and you know kind of compounded with all of this poverty are really high rates of substance abuse people who are, are in really desperate times and have grown up with parents who have and have learned that that is you know the only or one of a, a very small number of coping skills and who are introduced to addiction at very young ages and so I think all of these issues makes it a really interesting place to be doing work um, because there is so much violence and so much generational trauma. I know that answer was yeah. a little bit all over the place, but I hope that answered your question. It did. It did. Thank you for that. And thank you for the detail. Um, so um, I'm curious how, how you've evolved your approach to fighting rape culture since college. And having heard you describe um, you know, the communities that you're working in now and some of the challenges they face and oppressions that people living in those communities face. I'm just curious, how, have you evolved your approach? And if so, how? Oh, without a doubt. Um, you know, I think being in a university setting, you're able to navigate conversations in a very academic way. And when you know, working in an area where there is not only, you know, a very inadequate access to education, but also, you know, not with the isolation, not really having access to a lot of the ideas, beliefs, and diversity that I had access to in college, um, I really had to change a lot of my approaches and you know it's not that my goals have changed but it's my tactics had to change in order for me to be successful in my job so you know I for instance I um, have moved from things like direct action of having protests having vigils you know really having public displays of disappointment with the university administration or the local law enforcement to doing things like advocacy and prevention work in communities that don't have access to very many resources. So going to schools and talking to folks who have, you know, teaching them about consent and boundaries and what a healthy and unhealthy relationship is. Got it. And then I've also in that time, I've also um, medically transitioned. So it's been a very interesting dynamic of being a masculine presenting person and the ways in which I have to use that to navigate my role in this area. Um, it was, you know, it's definitely been a point of reflection that I use often of, you know, reflecting on the space that I occupy. But it's also, to some degree, been an advantage that I'm able to have access to conversations that I didn't used to have access to. So that's been an interesting thing. Um, but my understanding of the issue has really changed as well. I, I think in college, I was a survivor of sexual violence who was really mad. And I, that really showed in a lot of the work that I was doing was I wanted people to be held responsible for the ways they were treating survivors and the ways that they, you know, weren't doing the prevention work that they were capable of. So now that I've been working with a really diverse population of people who have had a diverse, I guess, a population of people who've had a very diverse experience that um, it's really given me a lot more humility and I've, been able to understand a lot of the systems in this area that I didn't really understand before and 
I think it's, yeah, my, my approach has definitely changed a lot. It's become a lot more tender of realizing that I need to be truly meeting people where they're at. I can't go into a conversation thinking that I know the answers because even if I might have, you know, an, an idea of how I want a conversation to go or something, you know, a goal that I have, I need to realize that, you know, the folks that I work with are the experts of their experiences and they've gone through things that I can't imagine. And me trying to throw out, you know, radical politics in the first conversation we have is continuing to be isolating and really being able to take a step back and listen and learn from people and learn the ways in which these issues have affected their lives and, you know, being a resource for them versus coming in and telling them the ways that they need to live or the ways they need to heal. Wow. <laughs> so um, I'm going to confess right now, Charlie, that I'm going to be quoting you um, about the experts of your, like being an expert of your experience or people being the expert of their experience. I love the way that you put that. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate all of those wonderful answers. And I know we've got some questions coming up at the end of the webinar, so hold on. And I'm gonna pass it over to Erin. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. So um, the first thing I'd like to encourage everyone on this webinar to do is sign up for our alerts at www.reproaction.org, which by the way is a brand new website that we're super proud of, so go check it out if you haven't been there recently. Um, and then follow us on social media. And then unfortunately, it looks like the PowerPoint that we have is wrong. So I'm actually gonna put it on the screen so that you can see it. Our next webinar is going to be on Thursday, August 24th, and it'll be at 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern. And the topic is going to be on maternal and infant mortality. And I super apologize. I do not know how I got an old version of this webinar PowerPoint called up, but I did it and, um, and I do apologize. Um, so with that, I will pass it back to Pamela for Q&A. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm suspecting that Mercury is in retrograde or something. Um, so, um, so thank you, Erin. So we do have um, space for questions. So if you have questions um, that you would like to ask Erin um, uh, or myself or Jessica um, or Charlie, please drop them into um, the question tab and we will try our best to answer those questions. The first question I have is for Charlie. It's from Kayleen, and Kayleen says, hi, Charlie. Um, I, uh, I actually went to OU and graduated in 2012. I think it is wonderful that you started a conversation around this. It is definitely needed. I was wondering in what way, if at all, Greek life has been involved in this conversation. Hi, thank you so much for asking that question. Um, you know, I will say that this is probably one of the ways that I've grown and changed my approach um, because during my time at OU, I was very resistant to work with Greek life, um, mostly because I didn't necessarily feel safe in those spaces. Um, but this past year uh, during Greek week, they actually had sexual assault awareness as I don't know they're like Greek week theme um, because of the survivor advocacy program um, regaining its confidential services on campus so I don't personally work with OU's campus but I know that there are folks who are working with these issues um, with Greek life I know that wasn't a very satisfying answer but I can say that I was not, that was a, a shortcoming I had while being a student activist. Um, but I guess now that I think of it, I did just do a bystander intervention training um, with about 60 uh, 
fraternity brothers. Um, I can't remember what chapter, but it actually went really well. So I, I know that wasn't satisfying, but I probably don't know much more information than that. No, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, so the next question is from Le Leah. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, so thank you. What is going on with the Helms Amendment to get abortion access to survivors of um, of rape um, and in war in um, the third world? And Erin, do you want to take a first stab at that one? Absolutely. I'm happy to. So. Um... And am I coming through clearly with my sound right now? You are for me. Excellent. Okay. So the Helms Amendment bars coverage for abortion and foreign assistance in cases of um, in cases of uh, abortion as a quote method of family planning unquote. So there's no reason to believe that that excludes um, coverage for abortion in cases of rape, incest, and life endangerment, but historically it has always been interpreted that way. Repro Action took leadership on the Helms Amendment during the previous administration and really called the Obama administration to task. We were, um, unfortunately, the Obama administration failed to reinterpret the Helms Amendment. So then in comes the Trump administration and Donald Trump, who has basically uh, created the most hostile anti-abortion administration in the history of the Oval Office. And so we know that one of the first things that he did was to slap a new global gag rule in place, which is separate from the Helms Amendment. Um, it's not in terms of foreign uh, U.S. foreign assistance, but rather what the global, global gag rule does is that it bars U.S. foreign aid from going to fund institutions overseas that do family planning work and also refer to abortion. So he actually made the global gag rule much worse than it has ever been in the history of the global gag rule. The Helms Amendment is still sitting there. So long story short, where we are right now in 2017 is that um, overseas, there is no funding for abortion um, coming from the United States. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, Leah, Leah wanted to um, share that uh, she runs a Facebook group called Freedom for Survivors that is dedicated to getting health care, um, including abortion access to survivors of sexual violence around the world. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and we do not have any other questions at this time. So feel free to drop any questions that you have in the question tab on your GoToWebinar control panel. Erin, did you have anything you're dying to ask? Actually, I do. I'd love to ask, um, I'd love to ask Jessica Ensley and Charlie both to answer this question, um, given uh, your shared leadership on the OU campus with fuck rape culture. Um, so my question is, can you, in in your own words, why is rape culture a reproductive justice issue? Charlie, would you like to take this one first, or would you like me to go? You can go ahead. Alrighty. Um, so to me, rape culture and reproductive justice are intrinsically tied because it all comes down to autonomy and personal autonomy. Um, I myself am a survivor, and I know that when I was assaulted, my agency was taken away from me. Similarly to how were I to become pregnant, I want full agency over my own body to make the best decision for me. Um, and so, yeah, I think the two go hand in hand because it all comes down to you are the owner of your own body and no one has a right to tell you differently. And I'd love to hear what Charlie thinks. I mean, I think you answered it perfectly. Um, I think, you know, sexual violence is all about power and control. And I think that the restrictions placed on people with you know, reproduct, or, you know, with uteruses and things are 
it's a it's an extension of that that people are trying to have power and control and domination over someone else's body when you know obviously that's not right so i think jess answered it perfectly thank you very much that definitely was helpful um so I'm not seeing any more questions pop up um, at this time. Um, Charlie, did you have anything you wanted to add that we that I didn't get a chance to cover? No, that was fantastic. I really appreciate having the opportunity to participate in this. It was, it was really great. Thank you. Well, we were thrilled to have you on and of course, um, uh, we're thrilled to have Jacqueline on earlier. And um, so, Oh, um, so I do have another question that popped up. And since we have a few more minutes, I'm going to go ahead and ask it. Um, so the question is from Chris. Um, are you involved at all with um, women who conceived after a rape but, um, but wanted to keep the pregnancy um, and, uh, and not have to defend themselves against a rapist who could sue for custody. Um, I know that that's an issue in certain areas. I'm not sure if that's an issue in Ohio. Charlie, are you there? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I cut out for a second. Um, could you please repeat the question? Oh, sure. The question was about um, uh, people who conceive as a result of rape um, and um, face the potential of either custody um, challenges from their rapist or having to um, still be involved with their rapist because um, they've chosen to continue their pregnancy and um, whether you're involved in any of that work. Oh, absolutely. Um, I would say that a lot of the incarcerated population I work with who have children, um, a lot of their children are products of rape. Um, I think that a lot of times we, even if we can know that rape is not, you know, four out of five times it is perpetrated by an acquaintance or a loved one, I think sometimes when thinking about having children with a perpetrator, we lose sight of that. So I work with people quite frequently who have had long-term abusers who they have had children with. Um, and I think that's a really painful reality for folks when they start doing the work because, you know, oftentimes, whether it be through not having the language to talk about their experiences or for to protect themselves, not being able to acknowledge what that experience was, um, it can be a really hard thing for people to confront that, in fact, you know, their children were a product of sexual violence. Got it, thank you. Um, and then I do have another question from Vanessa. Um, the question is, um, how can we in our day to day break this pervasive violence without alienating older generations like parents um, who may fear that this quote radical politics and quote type speech will make us targets while still trying to get them um, to understand the issues involved in the prevailing silence um, it espouses. Is that Charlie? for me? Yep, you wanna take that one? Sure. Um, so I think a tactic that I've used in my work has been trying to push people to think more critically about their language and actions. So, you know, something that I may have done in the past would be to kind of jump down someone's throat a little bit and be like, how could you say that? Can't you say see that that's, you know, a very misogynistic statement or that that's, you know, a rape joke or whatever that situation might be. But I think I've started to lean towards questioning people of, you know, 
what do you mean by that? Or who taught you that belief? Because I think when a lot of people are attacked, they can get on the defense and then they're unable to really listen to what you're saying. But if you have people pause to think critically about, well, what am I really saying when I trivialize sexual assault or when I, you know, think that it's appropriate to harass people, that does not, is not always effective, but that's kind of one of the smallest steps that I've taken in working with folks who are a lot of times very oppositional to the work that I do. That's really good advice, Charlie. And I, I gotta admit, I um, confronted that um, recently with an older family member who was trivializing um, the Cosby um, rape trial and, um, and, you know, made a complaint completely horrible comment about the accusers and um and and I did actually um my my first instinct was to go off on him but then I <laughs> took a deep breath and um and began to just draw out um the conversation and and so I can personally attest that that was actually very helpful um in kind of digging beneath this kind of um what is apparently flippant, but is very, very dangerous and very damaging um, and really drilled down. And we actually had a very good conversation um, at after we um, kind of burned through <laughs> the initial outrage. <laughs> um, so thank mm -hmm. you for that advice. I think that's great advice. Um, Absolutely. And I will say that, sorry, that, you know, I still have bad days where, you know, I got into a pretty blowout fight with family member of mine pretty recently that you know sometimes it is exhausting to be the patient one um, so be gentle with yourself in times that you might have a little bit of an explosion because this is really hard work and sometimes someone can catch you in just the right way on an off day so true so very very true um, so we it looks like we don't have any more questions. Um, and again, I want to thank you, Charlie. I want to thank Jessica for your work on pulling this webinar together. Um, thank Jacqueline for being um, fantabulous. And of course, always my co-director, Erin, um, for juggling some logistical drama, but still um, producing quality, awesome work. So thank you, Erin. Um, and again, I just want to, before we sign off, um, please do check out the new awesome uh, reproaction.org website. We are super, super proud of it, and we hope that you enjoy it and give it a whirl. And if you haven't signed up for um, our alerts, please do so on that website. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to the attendees, and have a fantastic night. Goodbye. Thank you. Good night.